Okay, go ahead, please. Good morning, so my name I'm is Najibula Ender, and my group mates are. Oh, I'm Michelle. I'm Brian. So our topic for the final uh, project is uh, ethics of enforcing term of the service account sharing, as it's been raised recently by the Netflix. So the phenomenon of account sharing grows with the rise of the streaming service and other digital products and services. The majority of these services include those in entertainment or the subscription-based price. So uh, the price model entices people to want to share their account, trying to get more money for their money, despite that the allure of the streaming service in, involved having alternative to purchase the entertainment. Specifically the, for the TV streaming industry, uh, which was uh, uh, expensive and uh, uh, people were forced to buy like money bundles for different shows and uh, to watch their favorite shows. So it was hard, but uh, now we got the streaming service and social media revolution in the, in the Bay Area and Silicon Valley. So uh, with this uh, streaming services, now people are sharing their account uh, information with other people, like uh, the now the the Netflix or streaming service are cracking down on the account password sharing across the household. This was inspired by the current news of the Netflix rolling out this feature in Chile, Peru, and Costa Rica. The motivation is. Uh, why companies are doing this is because they are losing a big uh, portion of their revenue, like uh, it's about like uh, billions of dollars. Uh, so in this statement, like they claim that they are, uh, that uh, 100 million of household use share password, according to the analysis on the demand DV video streaming services, they lose about 25 billion dollar per year by account sharing. This problem is only getting worse due to the millennial and generous preparing to uh, share password. Netflix uh, is uh, uh, where giant company. Now we got the problem that despite the fact that user is unethically violate the uh, term of service, it doesn't justify a company unethically prevent user from violating the term of services. It is like like they are don't fight fire with the fire. It will be difficult to enforce the term of uh, service in regards to its uh, household limitation as the enforcement of it will likely cause privacy and security concerns. So we we have uh, discussed uh, three ways uh, uh, for the term of the services, uh, which uh, are uh, uh, using location data government uh, or medical healthcare data or uh, sign on services. Now I will take to the Brian and Brian will give you more information. All right, yeah. So the first method we're gonna talk about is using geolocation to determine um, kind of, okay, what geolocation does is it's using digital tags to determine your lo location. And this is like derived from, from like IP address data, or um, cookies for identified information. And when companies use this in conjunction, they can determine if accounts are really account sharing. And um, so the idea behind IP addresses is that you can use IP address network routing data, like network routing data, which can map to ranges provided by the internet service provider. And this can all be determined by um, IP address information. And also with cookies, you can determine the identifying information. And so, yeah, inside this graphic here, you can see that you can use these in conjunction to determine if you're account sharing. So the idea is that if you have the same device in the same location, then um, like, so if one person is using the same device and one person's in the same location on consecutive logins, then you can be sure that they are probably the same person. If it's the same device in different locations, well, since they're on the same device, it's hard to fake that identity. So you're probably gonna still be the same person. But then it gets, starts getting a little shady. So you have a different device, but you're in the same location. 
you're like, okay, oh, maybe it's a person who's using um, different, like a mobile phone or a desktop, or maybe a family that's sharing that same account. Well, on the very last point, if you have a different device in a different location, it's very likely that um, they could be account sharing, but maybe it still is really this, a different person just logging on. I'm the same person just logging in from a different location and a different device. So we move on to the next slide. Yeah, there's issues with geolocation because in the last two cases, especially the last case, you never want to false ban a paying customer because they're gonna, it's bad for reputation, it's bad for business. They're going to go on Twitter and they're going to start complaining. And then you got, a, you got like a whole scandal and everything. And um, so companies have been looking for more accurate ways. And um, so what Spotify did uh, a little while, 2018, they requested GPS data. So this is like coordinate coordinate location to track the person because um, it, it's more accurate. So you're, because generally IP addresses will give only a range and an approximate location. They have the exact location, they can make a more informed decision. But the problem is when you, have a music application like Spotify tracking your coordinate location, it doesn't really make much sense at all. In fact, Europe actually bans these kind of apps that require location data because they don't need it to function. So those are some thoughts to think about with geolocation and it's not really a good solution that companies have been good using right at the moment because they're just kind of flawed. Okay, and the this second solution that we have thought up of with, of course, the help from Professor Wu during our um, project proposal presentation. And the one that we're going to analyze next is official legal documentation. And we describe official legal documentation as like official documentation that would provide um, proof, if you will, um, of a household, but like in a different context than how Netflix describes it. They're like, oh, it's one location, most likely one router. Um, but for this, it's more so on a biological or familial basis, or maybe like more of a relationship basis. Like, I would just, however you determine to define that, it is really, this definition is more so in the hands of the customers. Um, so this is like different than um, geolocation because in a sense it is a tad more voluntary. The um, users themselves would have to go out and um, acquire these and then, provided as proof for Netflix to be like, yes, I am account member. And yes, you know, the person who's paying for it is indeed, you know, a member of my household. Um, and so some legal documents that can provide this information is for example, tax forms. In tax forms, um, the taxpayer can um, claim someone as a dependent. And, you know, if you are a dependent, then that means that um, someone else is responsible for all your finances. And so it would make sense that they would be part of your Netflix plan plan because you know the person was paying for Netflix. Um, another form is probably me medical records. This could be like proof of parenthood or like proof that you know you're related genetically somehow um, and so forth. There's a lot more. However, one problem with this is that it might provide some possible discrimination. So one of the first ones is um, across classes um, and we see this in like voter suppression where um, for a lot of poorer people in like poorer areas where the DMV is not like easily accessible, these people have trouble like um, attaining some of the um, some of the formal documents they need, and like this isn't even just going to the DMV; it's also like going there with like their birth certificate, or even like prove residency and register with them. And this problem would also carry over because if you don't have the forms on hand. Um, or you've lost them, they're not necessarily easily recoverable or accessible. And, you know, it's a long bureaucratic process. And if you're like poor and working like two jobs, you maybe don't have the time to like go and dig them out for um, a Netflix account. Um, in addition, this might be discriminatory to like LGBTQ plus couples because maybe in some states they are unable to attain documentation of their um, state of like relationship, like if they're married, because maybe like the state bans it, or they might feel pressured to out themselves, you know, sooner than they um, want to, in order to attain this, you know, documentation, you know, like outing themselves to like a government bureau or like 
some like for um, this also um, is problematic problematic for possibly polyamorous relationships um, or serious relationships for long terms without marriage and all of these cases um, you know like without marriage you don't necessarily have the documentation um, that you would need. And so another concern um, is in terms of security and privacy. So this question has been raised already with the Spotify um, geolocation um, test run that they did. And it's why does Netflix or any other entertainment service need such sensitive information, like who you're married to and um, who your family members are. And in addition to that, when you upload it and give them this proof, like Netflix um, for a short term will like have this data within their servers until they like verify and then they delete it or what have you. But like in that short period of time, what will these entertainment streaming services do to make sure that the information is kept secure? If it is going to be like encrypted, um, how long they're gonna keep it for and like what they're gonna do to also like network packets so that, you know, if some there's a, a malicious force within the network that your network packets won't get um, compromised and it'll leak that way. And another reason why this information or why this solution is possibly problematic is that if these companies require more than one source of proof, so say you have to like give like biological one in like your tax documents, a lot of these documents are traditionally like distributed. So like your accountant would have your tax documents and your parents would have like your birth certificate or something. But now like if you upload both, they're more amalgamated in one point. And so like um, a break, a hack into the databases would be like really, really bad. Um, and on top of that, it's not really that um, cheap for these companies to implement it because that would also mean that in order to do it correctly, they would have to invest a lot into security and storage um, in order to make sure that um, they retain customer trust. And now on to Brian for our last solution. All right, so our last solution is enforcing SSO. And what SSO is, if you're unfamiliar, is it's those sign in Google, sign in Twitter, sign in Facebook, essentially signing in with some account, like some popular like platform, like Google, an email platform, everywhere in all applications. And it authenticates the user using the provider, which is Google in this case, their credentials rather than their own password user combo, user password combo. And um, let me go on to the next slide. So the, the reason, the idea of this is that um, unique user password combos are prone to account sharing. They're just like floating around. They can be changed anytime. So you can make it, yeah. And they're easily shareable with anybody because it's not linked to anybody except for the service because it's just a user password combo. This is opposed to if you were to actually use SSO as the only method of signing on to your account. because SSO, single sign-on on its own, since it requires like this third-party provider, typically Google, which would probably be um, enforced in this case, you would need to give your entire Google, Google information, which is linked to your bank account, your social media. I'm um, sorry, you go back and forth. <laughs> Not really yet. Okay, yeah. And, and it's linked to a lot of personal information. And um, so, yeah, the whole idea behind the proposal here is that you enforce single sign-on and um, it's going to have be a lot of issues if, okay, um, yeah, imagine this scenario here where you have your friend asking for your Netflix account, but you can only sign on the single sign-on. So yeah, single sign-on is easy to implement. Uh, it, you only need to refer to the third party Google provider information, information to implement this. For smaller companies, they can use something like Auth0. There's a lot of public APIs available for you to implement it on your app. It's easy to migrate. The reason why is because a lot of, um, I mean, like 
all your accounts are already have a registered email address for signing on. So all you have to do is tell them to click log in Google. It will associate the registered email address with their probably their Google um, or any other uh, email authentication provider that they used. And it's not invasive. Like the other topics we've talked about was the geolocation and using government um, forms. And this just is literally just a single click and it targets the root of the problem which is preventing and discouraging them from actually sharing their account in the first place. <laughs> so um, this was mentioned a little earlier, but we had um, received some feedback during our project proposal presentation um, from Professor Wu. Um, and he really challenged us to, con to consider other methods of validating household data. Initially, we only wanted to look into the ramifications of peeking into um, users' network packets. Um, and and um, seeing how that um, was really not that ethical. Um, and so because he, he mentioned um, this project, the previous cohort of his PhD students were doing. And so he, he tried to see if we could also like, you know, stretch that into um, our presentation and report. And so we did that and credit goes to him. And so like in a summary, we have, well, we have come to the conclusion that single sign-on is most practical and ethical. Um, once again, there's no quote unquote rummaging through user data, um, no packets or documents. Um, so, you know, there is not much of a privacy concern and there's no additional infrastructure needed. Like, um, so it's also therefore like cheap for the companies and they have incentive to do it. Um, this also requires no extra steps from the user um, again, an email address is required anyways, you know, to inform you of news and like payments and things like that. And also for the user, there is no new account creation required. Um, for these um, entertainment streaming services, we also have to remember that they do store payment information, which is sensitive information in its own right. So in that sense, if you have like a flimsy shareable password, then it's not in the user's best interest because then maybe that payment information will become compromised. Um, and once again, to reiterate, using single sign-on gets to the root of the issue. It simply discourages people from sharing their account in the first place. Like nobody really wants anybody else to have access to look through their emails. Like that's pretty invasive. And so some lessons and the future. Um, we have only discussed like three solutions that we've thought of, but also with changing technology, we acknowledge that there are other account configuration options or authentication techniques that can possibly discourage or prevent account sharing. For example, biological metrics like face ID or fingerprint. Um, what would happen if you use those as a primary source to sign on? Um, and another thing, like a more broad question is, can companies really try to forcibly control user behavior? Like, is that a violation of personal autonomy that you know they're making users do these kinds of things? Um, especially because it's on the internet. So like, um, what are some of the um, rules that are imposed? Like um, if there's a social contract that companies and users should both adhere to, um, we kind of have no idea because the internet is kind of new. Um, and to follow from that, like what are people's rights on the internet? Um, you know, like what is personal autonomy on the internet um, per se? Like, you know, in this case, it's um, the right to privacy. Um, and finally, um, in terms of our, in terms of the solution that we found most um, effective, um, you know, companies should test, you know, having a single sign on only login, um, collect metrics and evaluate its efficacy um, and, and see how that actually plays out in reality. And finally, Thank you for listening to our presentation. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Let, let me uh, ask uh, 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 a few questions. I have actually written down a bunch of questions which I, I try to cover. Um, the first question, um, I, I like the idea of single sign-on. Um, especially, uh, I think that the, the spirit behind the idea of single sign-on is that 
we can, for, for example, the case of uh, uh, Netflix, uh, essentially we, we let everybody who has the access to the Netflix account to watch the content will also have the access to information such as a credit card that's actually paid for the, for the service. Which means that, I mean, in general, I understand that uh, it's a good idea to kind of discourage sharing uh, just the, the, the account ID and password to a bunch of friends and without any kind of risk, which is, is, is uh, I think is, is a good uh, concept to develop. So my, my question for single sign-on, this is a little bit uh, technical because I, I know the concept, I never actually use it. Uh, I want to ask all three of you, for single sign-on, is that easy for me? If, if I want to share my Netflix account, is that easy for me to just create a, a single sign-on, particularly for Netflix? And, yeah. and, and, and then I, I, don't, I don't actually even link my credit card information for Netflix. It's just, just a Netflix with single sign-on. And then I share the single sign-on with, with a bunch of my friends. Would yeah, that be a, a, a walk around? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, essentially you can. So single sign-on is just going to be linked to the private provider at the end of the day. So you can probably just create an email account on a mm -hmm. provider. So that will be one of the drawbacks of the solution. But I, but um, the situation is, is that a lot of the time, times when you share your password, um, I feel like just from personal experience, because I don't mm -hmm. have evidence on this, like the way I'm getting my password, like my, like well, I, I've just been asking, I, like, let's say like a new TV show comes out. And uh, most recently it was like a popular show called Arcane. And the thing is, I was like, oh, I want to watch it. So I just ask a friend and mm -hmm. then they'll be like, oh yeah, sure. Right. I can share you my account details. Like typically it won't be that like serial abusers are going to be real things. But the thing is that typically a lot of instances are probably just people asking their friends or people just sharing their accounts to people so that they can um, watch just some kind of show rather mm -hmm. than somebody just creating a whole account just dedicated to sharing. Right. Um, that will be a real thing and it's nothing preventing them, but it just right. prevents like a, a majority of users in which case right. are just sharing it, um, you know. Right, so, so Brian, ba based on what you said, I actually uh, want to spin a little bit for like a, from the Netflix perspective. Mm -hmm. I, I personally feel for Netflix business, it's a good thing for say, I have a Netflix account, say Michelle want to watch this particular show on Netflix today. And she actually asked me whether I can share my uh, credential with her. And I, 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 if, if Netflix actually provide me a, a very easy way that I can share with uh, uh, Michelle for this particular show, and this actually might even encourage in the future, Michelle realized that, hey, it's actually pretty good for me to be a subscriber to pay because I don't have to ask Felix every time I want to watch something. And if we can actually come up with a system like this, this actually help uh, to, to, to Netflix to expand the subscriber because people actually uh, use this account. So if we can come up with some kind of scheme that we can actually allow other user to, to do that. This might, might help in, in my opinion. Yeah. Okay, I want to actually ask the, the, the second question. Um, I actually, while, while you develop this work, I, I search around uh, Google, try to find out more detail about the, the account sharing, but I, I couldn't find too much data about what kind of behavior that people are sharing account in terms of the scalability. Let, let me tell you that what, what the scalability I'm actually uh, worried about. So if, if I have a, a family, I mean, I don't know the average size of the family in United States or in any country, but let's just pick a number, five. Assuming five is a, is a pretty good coverage of all the family size, assuming five, um, which means that um, if, if, if I got five different device from five different location using the same credential, that's, that's, I don't know how 
common that is. But if you have somebody's account and password that's actually beyond this number, say six, seven, eight, or some of them even 100 people are using the same account. I just wonder, the, the reason I want to see the data is that what's the proportion of the illegal account sharing beyond the threshold of five? If I actually mm -hmm. define the, the threshold of five, uh, if, if, the, um, if that's that part of the, that portion of the data, it's really a small part of the, uh, the, the whatever concern they have. And they're more concerned about more than five, then they could have a very uh, uh, um, simple solution to just saying that if you have more than five, then you won't be able to allow to do that. They can make it in the, in the re real policy. You can share whatever five people you have, but I'm actually going to check on those five. And, and do, you, do you actually come across with any real data about exactly what happened? Actually, um, Netflix employs the subscription plan called concurrent streams. So it doesn't matter how many logged in sessions you have, but you can only have like four, um, I think on their family plan, like four to five concurrent streams like going at the same time. So um, it means like if you're, you're logged on to seven different devices, only four devices can play at the same time and then your fifth, sixth and so on streams will be limited. So um, as of right now, they've limited it that way. Um, I think Spotify does something sort of differently where everyone has their own personal accounts, but then um, you can add people to your family. So Spotify's problem is that the people who are added to your family are in geo different geographic locations, but every account has, you know, its own amount of like allotted streams. So I think um, that's where like those like pricing models differ. Um, so like in Netflix's case, it actually, its current um, subscription model actually like um, incentivize or encourages, if you will, um, password sharing, because it's the only way that, you know, you can log into this family account. They, they don't have any like account linking mechanisms per se. And I mm -hmm. think um, that is part of it because um, they, they only have one method of logging in and right. it is through um, the unique password combination. Right. Right. I mean, I, was, I, 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 we have five for, for, for Netflix, <laughs> I, I think. Yeah. Uh, Wait, Michelle, can you go back to the first slide? First? Yeah. Or the first or second. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, the idea here is that Netflix originally, like, their whole model is around sharing their password. Mm -hmm. And um, the issue is that recently they announced a crackdown on password sharing, which doesn't make a lot of sense because even because five years ago, you see in this tweet, they said that love is sharing a password. So this is where people are confused and like kind of. Right. right. Yeah, I, I think, I, I think the, the, the I, I know Netflix probably don't want to share this kind of data uh, outside of the, their corporate. Um, they, they should really, but, but I hope they will look at their data and decide what's the, uh, the most meaningful way for them to uh, maintain their 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 um, motivation five years ago, and and try to identify what is the the uh, the most uh, important area for them to address, and and they they probably can even raise the price if they really want to, but but there is a competitor, right? There is, mm -hmm. uh, there is Hulu, Disney Plus. By the way, what other, like Amazon Prime, uh, um, Disney Plus or Hulu or, or uh, HBO Max, uh, are they doing anything different or their experience or they're actually because they're smaller than uh, Netflix, they don't have this, this the same issue? What, what are the competitor doing? Um, I think they definitely have the same issues. Um, I think for Hulu, um, I know because my family has Hulu this way, um, they bundle their services with AT&T internet provider. So mm -hmm. you can sign on through SSO, but through your internet provider. Um, so in that sense, um, when you do sign on to another device, generally for someone, because you don't want to send over your internet provider password and they can turn off your internet whenever they want. Um, the person themselves will like take your device in their hand and then sign on for you. 
Um, and so that also like really restricts it to just family members. Um, that's one of the ways that I know HBO has been doing. I think one of the more successful ones has been Apple's family sharing. It's similar to Spotify in the sense that um, you can invite people into like your family members. However, the head of the family, if you will, or the main account holder who pays for the family plan, they have access to like what is shared amongst the family because you can share cloud data, cloud storage, um, app subscriptions and things like that. And that includes Apple TV and like all the channels that are on Apple TV. So, you know, like some of your smaller streaming services like Stars, Epic um, are on there. And so if you have shared subscriptions turned on by, you know, the head of the household, then everyone can watch them um, as long as you're part of the family because someone is paying for it. Um, but people don't usually, um, you know, just like kind of like create um, Apple families willy nilly, even though they don't really have any preventative measures to make sure that it really is family members. I think it's mostly that the uh, main account holder just has so much power. They can like turn on and off like cloud storage sharing and like that would include like turning on and off like um, the visibility. So that means other people can possibly see your saved files and or edit them. Um, so I think that just really makes it so that it's mostly like actual households, like parents trying to monitor their kids, um, or like friends who trust each other a lot that the person won't just, you know, change it all of a sudden because they're feeling petty. Right. Um, I know Spotify has a login with Facebook, but what Spotify had done is that every account, I think probably can only have like up to one or two unique streams. Otherwise people would be sharing their personal Spotify accounts. And in mm -hmm. fact, that's, um, that was a large enough problem that that's why they capped it to like one stream per account so that the personal premiums weren't being shared. Yeah, I feel I feel that uh, there is a few things. I, I don't know if you realize that uh, um, in our industry sector, we actually develop a lot for large scale sharing. For example, uh, YouTube is a large scale sharing. You can actually share with a huge number of people. It's very open and we have individual, but this kind of small group sharing has been uh, behind in terms of technology we have. I think we need uh, the solution more advanced than what Apple, uh, you just mentioned, uh, Michelle. I think Facebook had a chance because Facebook is actually provide a social network service that you can actually control to have a small group. But, but Facebook has not been able to uh, introduce their, their group, whatever the, the social network model they have into other industry uh, at, as, a, as, a, as a dominating uh, way of for them to have the account. So which means that um, whatever you guys develop, this is not just for Netflix. This is actually potential for a, a generic, a small group of user would like to sharing. So as you mentioned that in Apple's case, the, the what do you call the leader or the dominating uh, player, they have all the power to do certain thing, which in, in my case, usually is one of our, uh, uh, one of our children, is actually usually have the account. And then the rest of us just have to use whatever uh, his uh, um, uh, setting to, to do anything uh, to do that. But, um, but you can see how common that we have a, a small group of people, five or six people, not necessarily family, but a, 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 a few coworker, a few close friends, they want to do something, which is, um, we, we don't have a, a really ideal solution, a security solution. Um, uh, single sign-on, I think, is, is, is a good starting point. And the thing is that, well, how do we actually make it more, um, uh, consider all the case that you have erased for the, for the situation with Netflix? I think that will help. You can think about in, in this sector, you have, you already have Netflix, Hulu, and a bunch of other things. But there is other um, um, service that's, that's potentially like a club and membership, uh, some other kind of membership for, uh, for food or for other sector of our life. I think if we, we develop that, that that's actually, um, if somebody come up with a really good solution 
and this will become a standardized. Uh, um, so if you think about single sign-on right now is, is kind of like a standard solution to deal with a standard kind of problem. And I think we need a new one that out of the work that you guys are working on. Okay. Right. So um, any of you will graduate this, uh, this, this, uh, this month? Oh, Michelle, oh, congratulations. congratulations. Oh, you too. And how about you? Uh, uh, Nachpula, uh, assuming you can get an ECS 180 credit. No, uh, I'm not graduating. I'm graduating next uh, year, okay. Paul. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Congratulations for all of you. And you will, you will, I hope you will be able to continue this work. The reason I'm asking, the reason I'm asking is that uh, hopefully uh, you can actually uh, carry on this this work. Uh, Natchbilla, you want to say something? No, no. Okay, there was some some Hello. some no noise from your your side. Yeah, I'm driving. That's why. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so uh, so uh, good luck with your next step. I'm going to turn up recording. Uh, I'm just thinking when I listen to your presentation, uh, if, if you guys are interested, I, I think I have a one former student working for Netflix right now. Maybe not at the VP level, but as a directory level. And uh, um, uh, he's a cybersecurity kind of person. And maybe, you know, if you're interested, we can probably approach them to see if the the, the company might, might actually be um, interested in hearing from you guys about what you would like to do, okay? All right, thank you very much. And I'm going to turn off recording.